Hi there, it's me, Jordan Van Haslow. Welcome to Jordan Van Haslow and Friends live on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Showtime with Jordan Van Haslow and friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM, Las Vegas. I'm so excited with today's friend. I haven't spoken to him. We haven't spoken to each other in years at this point. Someone I befriended probably close to a decade ago. Time passes so quickly. (laughs) <laughs> when uh, right at, shortly after I moved to Los Angeles, he is a screenwriter, he is a director, he is an actor, and he's a fellow Chicagoan as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to catching up, ladies and gentlemen, Marco Gruchek. Hi, Marco. How you doing, Jordan? <laughs> it's, it's nice to talk to you again. It's so good to talk to you as well. I feel like it has to have been at least like six or seven years since we last chatted. I remember we had lunch in Hollywood uh, uh, last time we met. I don't know when you moved out, but 2018, 2019, we probably had lunch together. 2018? That makes sense. That's when like I did the Vegas. So nine, 10, 11. Okay, so five years. God, time passes quickly. How the hell are you? <laughs> I'm great. I'm 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 good. You know, I've uh, I've had I've had ups and downs. You know, but I'm um, finally. You know, I got good health and everything else uh, is falling into place. Good, good. So I was checking out. I was looking at some of you. You have some really fun projects. I, I looked at um the the pilot that you did. Um, yeah. And I was also looking at the um the the trailer for the the rock star. The, the, the documentary, rock star, a tri- yeah, a tribute for the to the rock star, yeah. <laughs> so fun. Where do you, where do you, how do you come up with your with your content? Because what what I will say, having seen a lot of your work and like kind of just scoured a lot of like your reels, it seems like a lot of what you do is is if not autobiographical, semi autobiographical. Like it usually it, stars a guy named Marco <laughs> <laughs> walking around Los Angeles. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, many of my projects have been autobiographical. I write with what I know. And that pilot, for example, is about a guy who drives Uber and who tries to uh, make it as a filmmaker. And that's my experience in L.A. when I lived there. I used to drive Uber for a long time, you know, and I was trying to, you know, direct stuff and do stuff. So it's but it's a part of my story you know what happened there so yeah that's what i wrote that's what i knew and uh turned out to be actually pretty interesting it's called pilot or is it a pilot because is there more to it because i'm I'm so curious to know like is he gonna like get back at her (laughs) in mexico and like kind of set her up like that's that was where i'm like where is this story going You know, we just shot the pilot and we, you know, we got the synopsis for eight episodes. We're finishing color correcting and sound design. And then we'll be trying to sell it and see if we can get picked up and do, you know, the whole season, you know. Is this something that you've always done ever since you were a, a small child? Or how did you come and come to the idea of like, I want to be a storyteller? Uh, This all started uh, my sophomore year in high school. Uh, I went to a high school in Chicago. It had uh, uh, its own uh, film festival. Where in Chicago did you go to school? Von Steuben. Okay. And, uh, you know, I talked to my friends and I was like, you know, let's make a movie, you know. So we made movies three years straight, my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And we won a lot of awards, you know. And uh, I was like... You know, I like this. I seem to be pretty good at it. Why don't I just go to college for it, you know? So I went to Columbia College, Chicago for film directing, uh, and that's where I graduated. Yeah. Did you immediately go to Los Angeles? Like, what was the what was the next step after I gradu- that? I graduated in 2013, and uh, I moved to L.A. Uh, January of 2014. Yeah. Was L.A. everything you thought it would be and more? <laughs> You know, I I had a rough start. The first year and a half was pretty rough on me because, you know, I didn't know anybody. I just moved, you know, on a whim, didn't have any contacts, didn't have any job lined up. So it was a wild ride, two and a half days from Chicago to L.A. Oh, Uh, you drove and you drove as well. I I drove, yeah. (laughs) 
happy. So it was a tough year for me, you know, emotionally. I went through some stuff and, you know, I put some stuff down on paper, which I kind of made in a movie, into a movie later. Yeah, later on, after that first year and a half, things uh, got a lot better. I, you know, I got to know Los Angeles more and the people and I met some really talented people that I then worked with. It was good. It was, uh, you know, I miss it. I miss it. I, I, I go very often there and, you know, I stay for last year. I was there for six months. It depends when I have some project or something going on. I stayed there for longer. And, uh, but yeah, Los Angeles has been something, um, like a profound experience for me. And, uh, I really changed because of it, you know, I think in a better way. Yeah. Yeah. How's the Chicago film community? I mean, like, I, I mean, I haven't lived in Chicago in 20 years, but I don't know too much of the film industry here. I know of a Serbian community. Uh, they're doing a lot of theater and there's a Serbian Chicago Film Festival here. But uh, I haven't explored, you know, because I've been all of my contacts are in L.A., you know, so I don't know many people in Chicago to tell you the truth that do film. So talk to me about like all of your projects you have. all Like what's the what's the project that's that's like kind of like your pride and joy, like the one that you're like, I feel really cool that like that I was able to accomplish this. And you know, there's why. every project is dear to me in a different way, you know. I've had a success with almost all of them in, in one way or another. But there was a project in L.A. that I did. It took me three years to make it. It took me a year, a year to write it. Um, and it's called Unaligned. And uh, it's on YouTube and it has over three and a half million views. Mm-hmm. So that was something, you know, inspired by my previous relationship. Um, and uh, I just turned it into a movie later. And I worked with a lot, a lot of cool people, a lot of talented people in this project. And it's been, you know, it's been something I was working on in LA for a long time. Yeah. What's what's the what's the what's the process like as an independent filmmaker? Like, I mean, like just to get that to like over three million views. How do you like what's what's kind of like your process? Like once you put a film together and you like release it, whether it's like on YouTube or if you go, I don't know if you use aggregators or if you use distributors. But like, what's kind of like your, pro- like, do you have like a, like a routine or a process that you, that you follow through, like, you know, every time you, you complete a project? Not really. This is the first project that I really, well, not the first, maybe it's the second project I released on YouTube. Uh, but uh, it just, uh, it just caught on, you know, I, uh, I did not get accepted to a couple of film festivals and I was kind of down about that. And I was like, what am I going to do with this movie? You know, I invested a lot into it. So I was like, so I put a, I put a scene, uh, you know, on YouTube and it was there for like um, two months, three months. And, uh, you know, it got like only a thousand views. And all of a sudden I'm getting emails, you know, in two days, three days, it got like 200,000 views. And oh, people wow. are, co- Yeah. And people are commenting it like, what's the name of this movie? Where can I see the whole thing? So I was like, this is catching on, you know? So I was like, okay, I'll just release the whole movie. So I put the link in the comment section. And uh, in the first day of the of the movie being up on YouTube, he had over 14,000 views. In like 20 days, he had over 212,000. And it just grew from there. And, you know, now it has three and a half million. That's nuts. That's like insane. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you, for a couple of months, he just had not even a thousand views. And then all of a sudden, in two, three days span, he had over 200,000 and a lot of comments, like, where can I see this? So Were you ever like, able to pinpoint, like, kind of what led to that? Like, was it that you got caught in some kind of an algorithm? Or... Yeah, the thing is, it's a lesbian movie, you know? So uh-huh. uh, I think there's not enough contact, contact for LGBTQ people, uh, you know, on the web. Uh, not just on the web, but, you know, even in the industry on Netflix and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of people searching for that all over the world. And I I put it out for free, you know. I didn't, uh, I didn't do any commercials. I didn't do any ads, nothing of that. So a lot of people from, uh, from the whole world that don't have the premium, you know, a membership could watch it. So I would get a lot of, like, people from Brazil and people from, like, China and stuff like that. It's weird. Russia, you know, England. So, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people from India. 
so i like i uh translated you know into uh into hindu portuguese uh i think chinese spanish so i did uh yeah i did a lot of subtitles that uh, you know so other people could watch it oh that's wonderful that's wonderful yeah. what's your when it comes to like a new project what is your like process like are you somebody who like has a routine like i write every day for a few hours or is do you kind of wait until you have like ah eureka i got it and then you sit and type 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 a wave 12 hours a day what's your what's your creative process uh you know i what i do is when i think of an idea I uh, put it in my notes, mm -hmm. you know, on my phone and I just go from there. I, you know, put sticky notes here and there after, uh, and after that, you know, I come to the computer and I just, uh, write, uh, but I'm not a, I'm not a writer that I, I do it every day or, you know, I do it for a, a good amount of time or something like that. I'm not like that. I'm not a big writer. I, uh, I write only when I have, uh, an idea, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and, and I don't, you know, like I told you that film unaligned took me a year to write it. Mm -hmm. The pilot, the pilot only took me a month or two months. So that one went fast and, uh, it was just a spur of a moment. I used a lot of stuff. What I, um, uh, of what I had, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, uh, the friends that I had, you know, the cars that we can use and, you know, the people that we can use. So I actually gave names of the real people you know like myself and mia and alex and all other characters that were there you know i took from their psyche and you know who they are and i just put it in the script you know like i know alex well he's this way and he's that way he's also a filmmaker okay he's my friend i'm gonna i'm gonna put that in the script and actually i put i put the exactly how we met in the church you know he just approached me out of all of a sudden you know he's looking at me i'm walking and you know he's like hey where you come you know how long have you been here i'm like i'm trying to remember how do i know this guy you know <laughs> and, and in the process of talking to him i discovered that this guy doesn't know who i am and i don't know who he is and it's just it's just a weird situation and and we met that way and we've been friends since and we've been making movies together. So I just put, that's why it took me less time to write it uh, because I just used what I had, you know, uh, from the real life. That makes sense. Do you watch a lot of content or do you watch a lot of films? Do you watch a lot of television? Do you watch a lot of... Not as much as I should. Uh, and I'm very uh, picky about what I'm watching, you know. I, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I watched TV series, but ever since Sopranos ended, I just couldn't pick up another show, you know, it's just been hard, you know? That's a long yeah. time. <laughs> it is a long time. The only show that I've picked, uh, picked up, uh, after the Sopranos ended was, uh, Chernobyl and, uh, and the crown. I'm watching the crown right now. I'm, I can't wait. The new season just dropped. Yeah. I just watched the first couple of episodes of it. Is it's it really good? what I, yeah, it is. Well, it, yeah, it's no, it, it's yes, it's consistent with the other seasons. <laughs> okay, good, good. Well, what, is it that you, the other. what is it that you like, like about it? Because, like, so, like, like I know, I'm just curious because, like, you've mentioned two, two specific shows, right? There's the Sopranos and you have the um, the crown, and I understand what they are, you know, visually and how they unfold their storytelling. A lot of what I've seen you do is has kind of like a very comical bent to it, even if it's not like joke, 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 joke. There's kind of like an ironic or some type of a twist to it. What is it that you like about shows like dramas like The Crown and The Sopranos? And do they somehow influence your own work? I like uh, the, the writing and the acting, you mm -hmm. know, especially the writing it's very important to me and i think both the sopranos and the crown you know have a great writing team and especially the sopranos you know just the the, the scripts and the, the stuff they wrote 
you know, for those characters is unbelievable, you know? So it's just, uh, it's, it serves the story, you know, it serves the actors. It gives a lot so that the actors can work from mm -hmm. and, and the directing is really good. You know, it's, uh, that's, that's what it, I like. I like real stories. I like, uh, stories that come from life, uh, the real pain. The, I like the drama, you know? I think that's what connects me with the crown because that's a drama series as well, you know, and the mm -hmm. Sopranos, but I like I like the drama. I like the psychological thing behind every character, every person, you know, what they go through good and bad, you know, kind of like Sopranos wasn't just a mob show, but it was like a, a show about a family and friendship and, you know, the, and work and everything colliding together and everything that could go wrong, go wrong you know, with health issues, with work problems, with psychological, trying to stay on top, trying to battle, you know, every day and stuff like that, make deals, you know, and kind of like that impacts you. Everything impacts you one way or another. So, you, you know, something happens and then you're going to see it unfold that, you know, what, what happens next, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's really real. It can hit me. Like, I'm like, oh my God, you know, this really hits home. I, I've been maybe through something similar, you know, mm -hmm. and it's it just like, uh, I remember specifically after watching Sopranos, like, you know, an episodes by episode, I would have this emotional feeling when the, when the episode would end that it would take me like an hour to get back in, you know, real life and kind of like clear my thoughts, you know, it just would hit me so hard that I would think about it and I would just be so emotional, you know? Yeah. 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 No, that was a, that was a very special show and, and just all of, all of it was very special. Do you have, um, is there like a pet project or like something that's been like in the back of your head for a long time that you like really, really want to get made, but you know, just hasn't quite happened yet. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, I've, I've tried, um, uh, I haven't tried too hard, but uh, I've written, uh, you know, with uh, with another writer, I've written a screenplay for the feature for Unaligned. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, that script also needs still some more work. But I'm working on a new script that's based uh, uh, half, uh, half of it is a true story and the other half is fiction. Because uh, my great grandma uh, was in a concentration camp do during World War II, so that's something what I'm working right now, and uh, that's a very big passion project that uh, we're writing that right now, and um, hopefully, you know, we'll we can have that ready and trying to look for money to make that. Yeah, is it like a period piece? Like, does it take place? It's, yeah, in that it time period. Yeah, 1943. Oh wow. What a fat, like what a fascinating story. It's, it's, and she, I'm assuming she, she, she survived escaped. and, and, she, and escaped, so yeah. she lived to tell you the, the tale of it. Yep. Yep. Oh, no, well, not her, you know, I was very little when she passed away, but uh, her daughters told me the story. Yeah. Wow. Have you ever um, created anything that wasn't somehow connected to your life? Or connected to the lives of those around you? Like, have you ever done anything that was completely 100% fictional? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. I uh, I did a, a movie that is still being edited. It's a short movie I, I shot in 2021. Uh, but I, I wasn't happy with the way it was edited. I edited it myself. I just think it needs to be cut down a little bit more. And it's like a project that is still in the back of my head that I have to finish that's the only project that I haven't finished yet. Uh, and uh, it's totally out of my realm. It's actually uh, a project about a deaf person mm -hmm. who plays the piano and who teaches this guy who helps her move uh, the piano uh, to into her home. She teaches them how to play the piano and they fall in love. So, But she's deaf and she can hear the vibrations of the of the keys and that's how she what's it called uh, uh she can feel the vibrations of the keys and that's how she knows uh, how to play that was something totally different and i i had to talk to a person who what's it called uh spoke uh, the deaf language you know and she you know like uh she recorded you know some speeches and some words that we had to learn so you know uh so how so we can talk in the deaf language 
Oh, that's clever. Where did that story come from? Like you like yeah, where did the story come from? I have no idea. That's <laughs> it was just a spark of the moment, kind of like uh, you know, I was still in LA when I wrote that piece. And uh it was just like um uh, I wanted to do something something short and somehow I was like, How about a deaf person that plays the piano? And and it just it's, you know, it should be a love story, you know, and that's that's how I made it. Oh wow! Did it do the festival circuit, or and, and can no, we watch it now or no? No, there's only a trailer that it's up on YouTube, but uh, I'm still uh, I'm gonna give it to this other editor to uh, cut it a little better and cut it a little shorter so you can go to the festivals. That's wonderful. So, how many projects are you person? Are you always just working on a thousand and one things, and you have like a thousand and different pies? going at one at once or do you are you a person who kind of like focuses on a, a, a couple of things and it's like this is what i'm doing until it's completely finished i usually do one project until it's completely finished but uh, in the past two years i've been doing three projects you know i've been doing uh the documentary about the bano impersonator i've been doing the pilot and i'm writing this uh uh story about world war ii or concentration camp so that's those are three projects that I'm working on right now. And they came, I don't know how they came all together at once, but I'm very happy that I've been able to juggle all three of them at the same time, you know? So hopefully one of them, you know, makes, <laughs> it, makes it somewhere, you know? I love it. Let's talk about this Bono impersonator. So I was like totally confused just when I first came across it because Jose, he was like, oh, Marco's working on um, a documentary about a Serbian rock star. And I said, okay. And then I see the thumbnail and I'm like, that looks like Bono. Yeah. And then I'm like, first I thought, I was like, oh, wait, he's working with Bono? But then I thought, wait, Bono's Serbian? Like, I was like totally confused. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, this is an interesting project because, uh, uh, right when I moved to LA, that's the first thing uh, I shot. We shot uh, a concert in Las Vegas. I met him through my uh, uh, old roommate. Uh, I met Pavel, uh, Pavel Sfera, that's his name, the Bound impersonator. And, uh, and I was like, I got to make a movie about this guy. He's so fascinating. You know, I was in his company a couple of times. And every time I'm with him, there's like, you know, 30 people surrounding us all the time trying to get autographs and trying to get pictures with him, you know? So I was like, everywhere we go, you know, we go to the grocery store and there's 30 people, you know, they, they're like, is this do real they all, Bono? They, they, all think, do we, they all think it's the real Bono or do they? They don't know. They don't know. The thing is like, you know, they ask me like, is that Bono? I'm like, no, it's not. And then they're like, no, you just don't want to tell us. So we don't <laughs> bother him. And I'm like, okay, that's him. And, he, and they're like, no, it, it can't be him, you know? So whatever you tell them, it's a wrong answer, you know? <laughs> they they won't, so, but they're fascinated by it, you know? And um, and you got to see the documentary to see, to to kind of see, you know, what he tells those people, you know, when, you know, when they think if he's Bono or not, you know, it's, uh, it's a very interesting story. So we shot a concert for St. Patrick's Day in Las Vegas in 2014, and then, you know, we wanted to, you know, do, do the interviews and other parts of the documentary, but we just never aligned. You know, we always I had an idea and Pavel had his own idea and we never, you know, settled concrete on something. So it took us like eight years to, you know, shoot, you know, more, you know. So in 2022, we shot shot an interview with him and, you know, uh, and then this year. We've edited it and uh, it's almost, I mean, it's done, but we're going to, it's, I, I finished the version just for this f film festival. It's coming uh, to Chicago on, in, on December 9th. Oh, wonderful. Which festival? Film, Serbian Film Festival in Chicago. And, uh, and this is only for, this version is specific for this festival, but we're going to shoot some more in uh, beginning of January next year. So we extend the documentary a little longer and uh, we do some more stuff so we don't have to depend so much on the copyrighted material and the songs of you too, because those are, you know, hard to get. We've 
contacted you universal musical group but it's you know in the process with with them and you know how much it's going to cost us you know we're still working through that so we'll see at the end what we're going to put in the movie and what you know we'll have to leave out because of the copyright material totally is it is it feature length or is it is it... uh it's short it's for now it's 25 minutes uh we'll see how long you know the the new version is going to be i'm guessing i don't think it's going to be a feature i don't think it's going to be over 50 minutes if some miracle happens that we have some good material yeah if we can you know get another 25 minutes or more that'd be great but i i think it's going to be under an hour yeah i think that's so fascinating but of course like las vegas here in las vegas right um, impersonators and such yeah what's the, i watched the trailer so what's the angle is it kind of like us kind of seeing what it is to live the life of an impersonator is it what it is to just live like the show business life and the like, grind of that like what's kind of the angle of the of the of the film the angle of the documentary is actually, you know, how much uh, he lost himself, uh, you know, with, you know, being professional impersonator, how much, you know, he got, you know, he uh, copies Bono, you know, how close mm -hmm. he got to, you know, being somebody else and how much he stayed to be his true self. So that's the angle we try to, you know, explore how much he lost in the, in the you know, lost himself in, in trying to be Bano and trying to work this, you know, because that's his main job. He, like, he has a tribute band. They, you know, he plays, he does, you know, he, he's been in commercials, you know, acting like Bano and stuff like that. And you two knows about him, you know. I, I can't... I can't say some stuff still because uh, it's under an NDA contract, mm -hmm. uh, some stuff that he has done. But the U2 and Real Bano, they know about the impersonator, you know, they've been in contact with him. So he, one other great thing, if we can accomplish, which would be like out of this world, amazing, if we could get Real Bano just to have coffee with the impersonator, you know, <laughs> just to sit down and meet this guy because they never met in real life, you know? But so like in if... a public place. So the, so the public is like totally freaked out. Like, wait, what? Are... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be crazy. Imagine? Yeah, two bottles at the same time. <laughs> yeah, because we're going to try through, you know, through Bono's manager to reach out to him and see if he's willing to do this. Uh, this would be amazing. Like this would totally make our documentary, you know, better, you know. Uh, so we'll see what happens. If not, then we're just gonna, you know, have a Pavel and his story. How do you how do you like doing docs as it relates to um, relative to like scripted pieces where it's like your story, here are actors, here are the lines. Now you're telling someone else's story. And I imagine that there may be moments of like, you know tug of war or, yeah we're not like how do you how do you like one versus the other and and what are the, what do you what are the challenges that you that you see of one of the other over the other you know this is my second documentary uh my first documentary was in 2012 it was about a rock and roll band from yugoslavia and from serbia uh, in the 70s and uh, it's like one of those one hit wonder bands that became famous and then all of a sudden they disappeared and you never heard ever back you know from them again i like doing both i don't know i i think i'm more drawn to scripted material you know i like working with actors i really like the process with working with actors uh, through that and just you know trying to recreate emotion that is on the page that's very challenging and that's very real to me and i i love to go through the process of that with the actors uh, but, you know, documentaries are something that also real, you know, it depends, depends what kind of, uh, what kind of story you're telling, but it's, you know, it needs to appeal to me in order for me to do it, you know, right. This, the documentary about the rock band uh, in the seventies was also very close to me because I knew all those people. I grew up with their music. My dad played also in, in one of the lineups uh, in that band. So uh, that was really close to me. Uh, but this Bono documentary was not close at all. You know, I just met this guy, but I was fascinated that, you know, I just, you think about it, 
like, you know, this is America. And you just find out all the different ways that people make money. <laughs> and it's crazy. There's so many venues out there, you know, for them to do it. Because he's making money of just impersonating Bano. That's crazy, you know? <laughs> so he's like singing with a YouTube tribute band. He's doing commercials. He's, uh, he's like one of those guys that marries people, you know? Uh, uh -huh. how do you how do you call that what is that uh uh you know like a like a priest or like a, like a justice of the peace like like an officiator an officiator exactly so he does that as well he does like a lot of different stuff as bono <laughs> kind of like when you go to vegas and you see elvis impersonator marrying two people you know that's what that's what pavel is doing you know so it's just like i'm just amazed of you know all the ways that people can make money in this country you just, you know, a countless possibilities, you know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. Are there anything, has there anything that's piqued your interest that you've thought like, hmm, this could potentially be documentary number three? Like, has there, has there been anything as of late, you know, any Not story yet. or any person? Not yet. No, this is the documentary I'm still working on. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I kind of thought that the, the first documentary that I made, that was that would be my last documentary. But this kind of came all of a sudden because I, I do mostly scripted and narrative stuff, you know. But uh, so who knows when the next maybe documentary is going to pop out, something interesting. But I don't I don't really think about documentaries like I think about ideas for scripted stuff, you know, for scripted yeah. stuff. You know, I think of ideas all the time and I put it down in my notes. I'm like, oh, this could be good somewhere for this or for that or oh, this is an interesting idea. But the documentaries, they come out of nowhere. They're like, you know, it's just something that I'm interested in at the moment. Yeah. Well, before before we, we went on air. You and I were just talking about like Los Angeles and I was saying how it's so funny. Like, I feel like there's been like a great migration and a lot of the people who were part of my circle in Los Angeles a few years ago, like are no longer there, et cetera. How do you feel as a filmmaker right now compared to, you know, 10 years ago when you were first like, all right, I need to go to Hollywood and make movies. Now that everything is so much more spread out, people are kind of all over the place. People don't even necessarily go into the office anymore, so you don't necessarily meet people in person. Um, you know, technology is such that, you know, you can have great equipment anywhere. There's so many avenues for posting, you know, for distributing your content. Do you, do you find Los Angeles or Hollywood, and as an independent filmmaker, still a necessary evil or even relevant or do you do you find now that you can kind of do what you want to do wherever you want to do it personally for me la was great uh because i uh i made a circle of of people that i like to work with and that i worked with and that i like to work with again so whatever i am if i'm in serbia or i'm in chicago i know if i have a project I know who I'm going to bring here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't have to be in LA to make a picture. I can bring those people, you know, just uh, pay them a ticket and bring them over here or mm -hmm. bring them to Serbia. And that's what I'm hoping that I'll do for my future projects. I, I think I benefit the most from networking because when I was at the college, I did not network as much as I should have. And that's the only regret I have, you know, when going to Colombia. In LA, I really, and I really met you know, people from all kind of backgrounds, from all, you know, parts of the world. And uh, that's what LA doesn't lack, the talent, you know. And every year, you know, a new talent, you know, new people come to LA and, the, you know, the pool just gets bigger and bigger, you know. So LA does not lack talent, you know, but it, it lacks, you know, uh, some new filmmakers, some new stories, you know, we don't want to see you know, all the new Marvel movies or, or stuff like that. I think, you know, we want to see some real stories like, you know, the directors that came out in the 70s, you know, and in, in, in the 90s and stuff like that. You know, we want to see more real stories than just CGI and big Hollywood blockbusters, you know. That's mm -hmm. what I think LA is lacking. But I think you can make a picture anywhere right now. You just have to, for me personally... I think I've met the people 
that I want to work with. Of course, I'm going to meet hopefully more people as I go along in my career, but uh, I know who I'm going to invite now. You've got your crew. Show. You've got your kind of core crew. Yeah. Like, okay, these are my yeah. folks. Yeah. Yeah. That's a cool, that's a cool thing though. Right. Because then also not only like, do you know, like the level of output, I imagine working together after so many, uh, you know, times of working together, all of a sudden there's a shorthand, like you, you guys kind of get it without having to necessarily overly explain things and overly yes, explain yes. processes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really, that's really cool. So how did you end up back in Chicago? Cause you don't do any, you don't really do much filming in Chicago. And you were saying like, you're not really in, in the film yeah. community. All your people are out in Los Angeles. How, what, yeah. what, what, how did you make your, your migration back to shy Uh Well, my parents live here. Mm -hmm. And my sister lives here. So uh, they bought a house uh, in the suburbs of Chicago in uh, in 2020, I believe. Uh, and, uh, you know, some really kind of bad things happened, you know, uh, in L.A., you know, with, with the pandemic and a lot of mm -hmm. other stuff that happened to me personally. That kind of, you know, made me think that, you know, maybe I just need to go home for a bit, you know, and trying to figure things out from there, you know? Totally. And so, you know, there's a quote, there's a quote from a movie called 15 Minutes with Robert De Niro and uh, Edward Burns. And Robert De Niro says, sometimes you need to go away in order to come back. And uh, I really believe in that. And that's like my motto. Sometimes you need to go home sometimes you need to clear your head sometimes you need to step out of the filmmaking process because it can get really frustrating sometimes with the projects when and especially when you're a young filmmaker who's not you know known that much you know outside your circle who doesn't have the money who's trying to get money to produce his projects it can get frustrating you know trying to yeah. you know do fundraisers and beg people for money and trying to find producers, you know, and, you know, also invest money on your own. You know, that's what I do all the time. And sometimes it's like, it's like you're stuck in this race trying to make something happen. And sometimes you just need to chill out for a minute. And, you know, I, I thought, I thought when I came back to Chicago, the maybe I will do something else. And my parents wanted me to do something else. They're like, you know, get a regular job, you know, <laughs> be, be a normal person, you know, go to sleep at night and wake up, you know, in the morning and go to go to a new job. But I just I step back and as 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 months and months passed, I've realized that this is my passion and this is who I am and I cannot do anything different about it. I have to make movies, you know as long as it takes me you know i have to make a project or two this year if not then next year you know there's only all these ideas coming to me and i'm like oh, this is a great idea i gotta i gotta produce this this i gotta direct it there's no way you know so i've by stepping back from la and thinking maybe i gotta do something else i've realized that the more i stepped out of the spotlight the more i realized that this this i cannot be different this is what drives me and this is what makes my life meaningful yeah this is you know i think everybody you know i know i can say for my family my sister found you know her you know she made a family she has two daughters and that's that's her life that's you know her daughters are her life that's you know that's what means to her that's what she lives for to go to work that's what motivates her for me my projects motivate me. Ideas motivate me. When I hear, when I watch a good movie, I'm I, I'm amazed. That's what you know. I'm emotionally pumped, and I'm like, that's that's what really drives me. And when I came back to Chicago, I was like, you know what? I'll go back to LA. When I have a project to film, I'll film it. I'll come back. Maybe I'll move back there again. Maybe hopefully this project you know, the World War II piece works out and I can film it in Serbia in, you know, maybe next year or in the future. So I've been just thinking of new ideas and new projects. And uh, I've realized that uh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. 
That's wonderful. Well, you talked about, you said it was like 2020. That time period was really strange with, with what with the shutdown. And I feel like everybody kind of went through like a, what am I doing? Kind of like moment yeah. of like self-reflection. Like, am I, should I be on this roller coaster? Should I, or this treadmill? Should I not? Did you ultimately find, because one thing I'll say, like, I know, you know, um, that time period was very horrible for a great number of people. I found that I had like o- over that period of time, I felt like I was at my most creative. I feel like I, I, I was able to output so much creativity because everything was shut down, right? So there wasn't those added pressures of, oh my God, I have this deliverable to this person on Tuesday. Oh my goodness, I have to do this. Oh my God. Like no one was necessarily trying to find me. No one was necessarily, and it was just, I could get up every morning and say like, okay, what do I want to do today? I know, write a pop song or whatever. Did you find um, from a creative standpoint that that time, that that was a, that that was a, um, a, a, a what's the word? Not not positive, but like a, a an active period for you creatively or, or did you find that you were stifled a bit in that time period? You know, I was, uh, I was applying uh, for some, um, you know, funds for a project that I had. Mm-hmm that uh we did not get the funds so the project never happened uh so i was doing that uh during uh you know uh making like a little bible in the package so we can get the funding i was doing that in the pandemic and i watched a lot of movies i watched a, I watched a lot of foreign movies and i caught up on a lot of things i was not as creative as after the pandemic after the pandemic i really got creative and all these three new projects just came about. Totally. Were you in Los Angeles the majority of the time? Half of it, I was in LA, and the other half, I was yeah, in you were back in You were back in Chicago? Yeah. Yeah. Yowzer. That's so nuts. So you've also done a lot of music videos. I've done a couple, yes. I've done a couple. It's been actually a lot of fun. I, I try to do uh, more of those music videos, but uh, it just it just didn't happen. I just wish I've done I've done more. I've done more of music when I, cause I knew a lot of musicians when I moved to LA and I also, uh, you know, in 2018 and 2019, I had a band and I played drums in a rock band. So I met a lot of musicians. Uh, you know, I used to go to um, Viper room. Yeah. I used to go there. There used to be, um, uh, I think every Monday was a jam night and a lot of people would just come out and, <laughs> and play songs together. And even people did not know each other. They would just jam, you know, and uh, I would go there uh, every week just to listen to new musicians. I met a lot of them, and it was a really fun venue. That that jam night was the best thing that they had, and they got rid of it after the pandemic. And I'm like, what? Oh. So it was a great way for new people to get on stage. They haven't been on stage maybe in a while, or they, you know, maybe they they wanna they they just came to LA and they're trying to break out and meet more people. That was the way to go. You know, you go, you play a song or two with some people that you don't know, and then new people come, and you, you would go on for the whole night, and then you would meet a lot of people. And that's how I met, you know, some of some of the people I played with, and it was a really fun time. I just wish I had done more music videos, but the music videos that I've done, especially the ones for Alana Sweetwater, were really fun. I had a we had a lot of fun shooting uh, one music video that was the first music video i shot for her was called uh gotta get up that's mm-hmm. that was her song and we we went to joshua tree and we shot it in the in the desert like they had a jam session in the desert and they traveled we rented you know a minivan you know the Volkswagen mini bus and she was like picking up her bandmates along the way and and finally they get to the desert and they play together they play they jam in a <laughs> in the desert and that was the music video that was a lot of fun and that music video came out really good I, i'm really happy with how that turned out that's awesome do you still do you yourself still play yeah you uh n- not as much <laughs> i would want to i would i would really like to get back at it i just uh i don't like playing uh and practicing by myself i like to have a group of friends a group of people playing you know i love that energy exchange between people and uh you know uh jamming i just uh i wish i was in a band again that's that's what i'll tell you uh because it's a great feeling when you're on stage and 
you know, when you're playing with uh, talented people, you know, uh, it's different than, you know, being behind the camera. This is like you're on a spotlight too. And in the moment you're expressing yourself in the moment, you can't really, you don't think too much about it. It just moves through you and it goes with the flow, you know, and it's, it's a different feeling. And, and I like that feeling as well, you know? Yeah. Do you get, do you get a similar feeling um, when you're acting on film? I don't know if I'm that good of an actor, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, I uh, I minored in theater in Colombia. There was a one class that I had. Uh, it was with with this professor Tan Mula. I remember he was a great professor. He paired me up with this other kid, Jerry, and we did a bit from American Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the only time that I felt like I wasn't acting. It was, it was, that was the, the best experience I've ever had. It was just like, we were feeding off each other. I was giving him, he was giving me back and it was just this push and pull. And the, the, the professor loved it. He's like, I could watch you guys all day, go back and forth. And that was the only time that I felt like I really got into the character. Like I wasn't trying to act. I was actually in the moment doing it. Everything else. It wasn't like that, uh, you know, when I acted on film and stuff like that, it was just like totally different. And um, I don't know if I'm doing that great of a job, but but uh, it's it, it can be fun. You know, it can be fun. Uh, I don't know if I'm good to be a main actor, but maybe maybe somewhere along the line, I'll give myself an extra role <laughs> or something like a little stand in, you know, like Hitch, like Hitchcock when he walks through his movies. If you want. <laughs> Through the, through the shot and that's it. You don't even notice it. Do you think the difference is the lack of the live audience? You know what I mean? Like the acting on film is totally different yeah. than that energy yeah. that you're getting like when you're in front of your class and like everyone's like feeding off of your energy or like when you're on stage at the Viper Room and you're jamming and like the, there's an energy around the room. Do you think that that might be a, a, a piece of, of that? Yeah. I think that would be... Uh... You know, there's a couple of times when I uh, acted on stage, you know, in front of people, and that can be very, uh, uh, what's it called, terrifying. <laughs> uh, you know, when when you need to remember all the lines, and you're like, Hope, hopefully I don't fuck up. You know, hopefully I don't fuck up. But uh, on camera is different. You don't have that pressure. You know, uh, music I can play in front of the people. Acting. You know, I get a little, you know, um, a little terrified, you know, when I have to get on stage. You know, the biggest fear for me is like, I got to remember the lines because sometimes I'm like, you know, uh, I, I right before I come out, I'm like going through my head. OK, <laughs> so this is the line. You're supposed to say this. OK, don't forget it. <laughs> I love it. Has there been... In your career thus far, you've been a writer, you've been an actor-ish, right? You said. Yeah. <laughs> you've been a director. Um, is is there any any area of the business or any type of role within the business that really interests you, but that you've never had the opportunity to pursue or to? I don't think so. I've I've done directing, I've done producing, I've done editing. I've done writing and I've done acting, you know, but acting is not something I will probably pursue professionally. All other things I think I, I can handle, but acting is not one of them that I, you know, maybe I could excel if I had a good director in front of me, somebody to guide me, but right. I, I, could, I could not guide myself, you know, I can to an extent, but I can see that that's not, it's not a hundred percent that I'm putting out there, you know, I'm cheating myself out because I can't see myself on camera. I can't see what I'm doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, I, I know I'm I'm selling myself short. If I had a good director that was telling me, uh, maybe I'll try it. Yeah, maybe. But uh, no, I've done, I've done most of the stuff I wanted. I just wish to continue doing it. And I hope that it gets easier, you know, because uh, the hardest thing about being a filmmaker is getting the money to make your projects, you know? And as yeah. you know, and you know, filming got a lot easier with the with you know with the uh 
you know, digital cameras and, you know, cell phones and editing software. Now everybody can have it on their computer and stuff like that. It got a lot easier, but also it got a lot harder, you know. I think it got a lot harder for people, new people trying to break into the industry, you know. Um, In what way? Uh, you the only reason I get... ask, I'm sorry, I was just saying because some people, you know, have said like, oh, now it's easier than ever before now because there's so many platforms and so many, you know, like there's so many different ways to go about building your career as opposed to say 20 years ago, you know? I think before, like if you made it, you know, you made it, you know, that there's, there's, you know, a couple studios and if you get there and if they buy your, you know, your film, it's going to show, you know, right now there's a, a lot of streaming platforms. There's a lot of noise. You don't even know where to go. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, it's like, uh, it's, it's hard to, to get on a, to sell your projects on a, on a good network. You know, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to get go on Netflix. I don't think it's easy, you know. And if you get on Netflix, it doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's going to do good. It's you know not like mean? how once upon a time, like you sold your show and it was on NBC. Like everyone exactly. knows about it. Everyone knows. Like if, if you, you're, exactly. you're totally, you've take, totally taken your career to a completely different level. I've seen some people, you know, that had some smaller movies that ended up on Netflix and nobody watched them because nobody promotes that kind of stuff, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, it's like, like you say, it's not a major TV studio that, you know, if you turn on the channel five or if you go to the theater at that time, you know, on a Friday night, you're going to see that movie, you know, it's different now. It's there's so much content and there's so much streaming platforms you don't know what to watch. You don't know what to buy. There's so many, you know, memberships that you need to buy. Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Netflix, uh, Hulu, and all this. You don't know, you know, you don't know. There's, you know, you don't know what to watch. You can't watch independent stuff because it's not marketed the right way. It's not, you know, there needs to be a commercial that is going to sell that show. And uh, if you don't have the money for it, you know, if you don't have the right people that is going to push that project, you kind of like didn't even make a movie, you know? What do you think is the harder piece of the puzzle? Raising the funds or getting distribution? Both are hard. I have raised funds for my films before. It's been hard. I haven't gotten the distribution I desired. I'll tell you mm -hmm. that much. I have a uh, my directing three project. My thesis from Colombia is on uh, Amazon Prime. It's a it's a thirteen minute short movie, and uh, it's on Amazon Prime. But you know, I I'm selling it for chump change. You know, it's like mm -hmm. it's good to be out there. So you know, so it's easily accessible. If somebody wants to watch something that you made, they can go on YouTube or go to Amazon Prime for my project. You know, but. Um, so it's easily accessible. It's good that it's on those platforms. I found hard to find the right distribution, you know, and maybe because I made short films, you know, most of the stuff I made was short content, you know. Uh, uh, I'm still to make my first uh, narrative feature. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I have one script, like I said, uh, ready. Uh, that's the unaligned feature that I wrote, but I'm not happy with that script. There's, you know, I got to work on that script a little more. What I'm focusing on is the second script that we're writing right now about the World War II piece, about the concentration camp. Uh, and I hope that to be my first uh, narrative feature. So maybe it's going to get easier if you have a feature project because, you know, some distribution houses won't even look at anything if it's not, uh, you know, over 50 minutes, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. They don't they don't want to waste time because they can't sell it, you know? Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see what ends up happening with your script. And just for our audience, where can they find you so they can keep up with everything as well? Uh they can uh they can go on my website. There's links to the you know the movies that I've made, to the stuff they can watch. It's my uh first name, my last name dot com, Marco So uh, 
uh, that's where you can keep, keep up with most of my stuff, you know, and there's links, you can watch stuff on it. Awesome. Cool. It was so great catching up with you. We're like at the end of our hour. I hope we meet again in LA and go out for a cup of coffee or go out for a night at the club or something like that and have Jose Maldonado with us. You know, totally. <laughs> I, I miss that guy, man. He, you know, he left LA as well, but uh, I'd like to catch up with you. I'd like to see you. Thank you for this interview and uh hopefully uh it won't be that long you know that we talk again absolutely well thank you again marco grucek and thank you all out there in radio land we'll talk to you next week for another episode of showtime with jordan van Haslam friends right here on hot 702.5 fm las vegas